Marsha, welcome back to Dire Conversations. Thanks for joining us again. Hi, Billy. Thanks so much for having me back. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we gotta we gotta make sure that we uh, wrap this whole conversation up. That now is a three part <laughs> series. So. Yeah. We, we were talking last time about like you became a Christian, you started going to different churches, kind of feeling out, you know, how you need to start serving God and things like that. And now you have an entire ministry of things you're doing. Like if somebody were to ask you now, I was like, hey, you have a ministry about new age. Like what is yeah. new age? How do you give like a quick, succinct answer about that? Yeah. And that, that's a hard to give a quick answer to that because there isn't a quick answer. Uh, what I, well, I say the new age is a belief system that draws from many different religions, primarily Eastern religions. And, but I have to say this, even though a lot of people don't know it, which means then I have to explain it, Gnosticism and new thought. I mean, that my definition of the new age is that it's a network of beliefs drawing from primarily Gnostic views, Eastern religions and new, the new thought movement. So when I give talks on the new age, I usually have to explain each one of those, how those influence the new age and where you see it in the new age. So I usually say it's a mixture. If I have to do a real quick thing and I'm not going to be able to explain all that, I would say, well, it's it's draws from a lot of different beliefs and mixes them and people are free to mix things as they want. But usually the belief is that you yourself are divine. You have a divine nature and that you'll eventually go back to God. So that's kind of a short, a very short idea of it, um, of the new age that I would give if I could only, if I had to say it very quickly or very simply. Yeah. So give a, um, give a short under, uh, help people give a, like a little short synopsis of what is Gnosticism, right? Like how would you explain that to somebody? (laughs) Yeah. That's another one hard to explain to. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, I would say the Gnostic, the Gnostic ideas that we see today in the New Age are that you make a distinction between matter and spirit. So the material world and the spiritual world are very distinct. And the spiritual world is is the true, is is the truth. And the material world is in either not really real or it's not the truth. I mean, the Gnostics thought it was evil, but the new age sees the material world as a manifestation um, of the, of the spiritual world or as a reflection of the spiritual world. So I would say the Gnostic, the Gnostic influence on the new age is to make this distinction between spirit and matter and spirit is always superior because in the new age, everything is spiritual. So that's one of my, I have an article called Everything is Spiritual. By the way, let me mention my my website, ChristianAnswersNewAge.com. Oh, Billy, I think since I've been on, I was on your program, I don't, I don't think that I had my new website. Well, you got to send it to me and I'll go back and retroactively put it in, because I got your okay. other one in the links for the other shows. So I'll go back and change it. Okay. Okay. Because I have, I've had a new website now since like, I think last May or June. Okay. Christian Answers New Age, um, dot com. Okay. And so I have an article on there called "Everything Is Spiritual in the New Age." Yep, I'll definitely get that in. Now okay. I know, like another early church dealt with, like in the in the New Testament, you kind of get like a proto Gnosticism, but definitely in like the second and third century, you start getting these Gnostic influences in the church, uh, and like you said, they made a distinction between the matter and you know the spiritual side and they also had this concept right comes from the greek word gnosis which means knowledge so they thought they had this special knowledge this secret knowledge right that only they could get and it was kind of a supernatural thing do you see that concept also coming into these new age religions where they think they have this secret knowledge this special knowledge yeah the idea that the knowledge is coming from within that you get it experientially through experiences and it comes from within is Gnostic. And that is also part of the new, that's another part of the new age is this inner knowledge. And that is your truth. So that is how truth is determined is through this inner knowledge through your, that comes via your inner experiences. And yeah, that's Gnostic. That's also, you see that in the new age as well. All right, now I'm going to ask you this question, and it might open up Pandora's box. But okay, <laughs> how do you see 
some of those concepts, right, with a overlaid with Christian ideas, right, to where it's actually not Christian ideas because it's really just New Age masses Christianity. How do you see that kind of mesh playing out in churches today? Does that make sense oh, to you? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Um, well, yeah, I definitely see that. Um, I think there's several ways that we see that. Um, I, I'm, and I'm going, I'm going to mention this, even though this could be a whole program. So I'll try not to, <laughs> to I'll try not to make it into a whole program. The Enneagram, okay, mm -hmm. which is a topic that um, I started warning on Facebook in 2014, and my first article was 2011. And, and even as late as 2019, 2020, a lot of Christians hadn't heard of it. Now it's like everywhere ministries use it. A lot of churches use it. It's it's basically a, a Gnostic type tool because supposedly this the, these numbers, knowing your type, is going to give all this insight about who you are and help you get closer to God and help you be a better Christian, help you grow in Christ. And it's, there's nothing in it actually to do that. There's nothing there. It's just the idea that it somehow can, um, by, by knowing your type, somehow it will give you all of this information and, and it, will, it will help you have all these insights. I, I see that as a very kind of Gnostic slash occultic kind of uh, concept. So it's funny that you mentioned that because I thought about you the other day. Oh, here's here's okay. why, because we've talked about the Enneagram some, and I've, and I've heard you um, speak about it, and I've watched some videos, so I do want to talk about it a little bit more, but here's what I thought about you. So I'm listening, I listen to a lot of audio books while driving, so I'm driving down the road, I'm listening to this book about fatherhood, right, and it's about how to be intentional, like not just raising a kid, but like making sure your child has an upbringing that's very memorable, right, so like the guy made real, a lot of really good thoughts about like, hey, take your kid back to like where you grew up and show him like, hey, you know, that place, this happened to me and that was really impactful. Or like, hey, you know, I grew up in that house or, you know, here's some people who helped teach me when I was younger. Just different things like that. Or like mm -hmm. having a moment when your child crosses from a child to, a, to like an adult, you know, even if it's age 14 or whatever, you say, hey, you know, you're now becoming a man and, you know, we're doing all this for other stuff. So the book is really good. But he gets like three quarters of the way through the book and he's like talking about how every kid's different and you have to like, you know, raise them differently. And he mentions taking a personality test, like the Enneagram to help you. And I was like, <laughs> oh, like I was drove my car off into a tree. I was like, God, come you're like, on. Oh no, you just ruined, you just ruined it. <laughs> yeah. I was I really know, liking the book. That awful. It just spoils everything. Yeah. So, uh, so for those who were kind of like me, like within the past year, I didn't, I've never heard of the Enneagram until I heard it from you. Give, give like a short understanding, like, Hey, this is what people say it is, but really yeah. it, this is kind of more of what it actually is. Yeah. And I didn't, I did bring it up and not explain it. So it is a diagram with nine points. It's a geometric figure of nine points num numbered one through nine. And these all represent supposedly a type a personality type of who you are and you are supposed to discover which type you are it used to be they the, the enneagram test didn't wasn't used at all it was never used i don't think it was used um i'm not sure it was even used in the new age uh, because they said you really have to figure out which type you are there's no test for it but now we have tests for it uh, so you take a test um, and then according to that number, then you read about that number and that's supposed to help you understand yourself. And then you're related to two other numbers. Plus you have a wing. So like if you're, um, if you end up as a type six, you'll either be type six with a wing five or type six with a wing seven. And that means something. And, you know, then if your husband's a type two, then that means something because you're a six and all this. And it gets very, it's like astrology. It gets very complicated with all of this um, meshing and interrelationships with the numbers. And so that is supposed to be a tool to give you insights into yourself and other people. But it has absolutely zero psychological validity. It has failed the psychometric test. 
Um, it, it, and Dr. Jay Medenwald is a Christian psychologist who has done some um, work on this. He's written articles and he also has given talks. He gave a talk at a, a group of psychologists whose specialty is personality profiling. And he did a talk on the Enneagram explaining how it does it fails these statistical tests and and when you try to test it it doesn't work because the categories are too broad and they overlap but anyway that's what the enneagram is and it got into the church um, when uh, the road back to you was published in 2016 by ian cron and suzanne stabile and then the sacred enneagram came out in 2017 by chris horitz ivp published the first book, Zondervan published the second one, and then they just started coming out of the woodwork, the Enneagram books. <laughs> and at first we were keeping up with them. Um, and when I say we, I mean me and my co-author, Don Vino, and he and his wife and I wrote a book called Richard Rohr and the Enneagram Secret. And so Richard Rohr has an influence and he's sort of another topic. I could actually do a program on him. So if you ever want to do that, we could do that too. Um, and because it really he's an influence in the church and so uh it got into the church and became it caught on and pastors started giving sermons on it started using it now ministries use it um, i have people who message me on facebook and tell me you know they've applied for a job at, with a christian employer or they've applied to work for a christian ministry and they've been told that they're going to be given the enneagram test and they're like, I know that this isn't good. What do, what do I say? How do I get out of this? So it is, it is definitely spread and doesn't seem to have let up from what I can tell. Um, and it is just a completely false invalid tool from the new age. It came from occult teachers and it was developed in the new age. Part of it came from automatic writing from uh, this guy who, who claimed that um, you know, his higher authorities or his spirit guides gave him the information. But now there's there's some Christians who are so invested in it that they've become apologists for it. There's actually a, a Christian pastor, or at least he used to be a pastor, who's a big apologist for the Enneagram, who tries to refute all the arguments against it. So um, I've done some Facebook posts on him. What's his name? His name's Tyler Zach. Z-A-C-H. He has some videos. He has a video where he tries to explain the video of Claudio Naranjo, one of the developers of the Enneagram. There's a video on uh, YouTube where he explains how he got, got some of his information for the nine types from his higher authorities. And this man tries to explain that these are not spirit guides, that these are other like psychological authorities or something, but it's not, that's not it's just not the case at all. And anyway, I did a Facebook post refuting his thing, his explanation. So um, I have a lot of articles on the Enneagram on my website for those who are listening and are interested in that. As, and then of course we have the book. But um, so that has spread. Now, another way I'm seeing this Gnostic influence in the church or the what way, you- do, you- do you ever notice, sorry to interrupt you, do you ever notice yeah. how Christian leaders in America are so like much fad followers. Like yeah, they're yeah they're trend they they get on trends they get on these so annoying these wagons yeah like something will start to get popular it'll get promoted um, in some way or the book will sell a lot or whatever and then pretty soon you see these churches begin to adopt it you know they mm -hmm. start they get the book or they have their congregation read the book. Um, there's several things going on like that with people like um, John Mark Com Comer and Peter Scazzaro, who I have articles on on my website, and I've read the two main books that, two of their major books that are influencing the churches. And uh, in fact, they fall into this other category that I was I was going to mention as what I see as a Gnostic kind of thing going on in the church, and that's what I call the contemplative movement. That was my phone. Sorry, I thought I sent right. <laughs> the contemplative movement or the I also call it contemplative spirituality that has become huge. What is that? Uh, I mean, that's already in a lot of seminaries. Um, so unfortunately, so people going to seminary to be pastor are getting input, you know, they're getting influenced by that. What is it? Uh, 
it's basically, it's a combination of things, but it boils down to the idea that there are spiritual practices that will help you become closer to God, help you hear from God, help you, you become more intimate with God. Like prayer and, and Bible study? Like what? <laughs> like prayer and Bible study? Well, yeah, see, no, not prayer and Bible study. That's the problem. It's not, it's, it's not prayer and Bible study. It's their form of prayer and their form of Bible reading called Lectio Divina. So, so a lot of it comes from medieval mysticism, medieval monastic mysticism. Spiritual formation is the term being used. But behind that term, you have the spiritual disciplines, the spiritual practices. Um, this initially got into the church through Richard Foster <clears throat> and celebration of discipline and then Dallas Willard. And they formed an organization called Renovari. And um, Renovari still exists, of course. Dallas Willard, I think he died in 2013. But Richard Foster is still um, around and his teaching is like a a kind of a evangelical twist on all of this what he what he teaches in celebration of discipline and in a in a video he and dallas willard did called the be still D, it's a be still dvd i have an article on it on my website it came out in 2005 and basically it's all the con mystical contemplative practices for the evangelical church and so at that point, when they did the DVD, it was, it was popular, but it wasn't real widespread. But since then, and since the Enneagram, there's a, 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 um, a connection, there's a relationship between the Enneagram and the contemplative spirituality. And what you find is that a lot of churches that do the Enneagram either are already doing the contemplative stuff or they begin to do it or vice versa. And so you find a church that will often promote both of those. So the contemplative stuff um, is very big. And the, now, have, did you did you remember? Did you grow up as a Christian in a Christian church? I don't know if you did or not. I, not, I mean, not. so we went to a Baptist church, um, which yeah. I mean, cr Christian, yes, but we were um, kind of nominal, you know. Okay. Were, I always yeah. joke with I always joke with people. Part of it was because I had ADD, so I was like never paying attention. I was a wild child, so I always tell people that the only thing I learned growing up was that um, Abraham built the ark and Noah died for my sins. <laughs> oh my goodness! That's, that's what I remember, you know, because I was so wild. I was just running around the church or running around You're outside. Just running around. You couldn't yeah. learn anything. And, you know, we, we went, you know, so Wednesday nights, you know, for the supper and, and we didn't always go on Sundays and stuff like that. My parents had to work a lot. So we, I think they did their best, but, um, you know, so I, I didn't really, it, there wasn't really any like strong central belief, you know, there was like a, I'm a Christian, you know, yeah. mostly because I'm, I'm an American and we went to a Baptist church. When I was like the Baptist church. Right. Yeah. And that's kind of, that was my thinking when I was, and going to church when I was younger too, but you didn't hear about spiritual directors. There wasn't a spiritual director in your church. Mm, was there? No, no. And I did not hear that term of, of spiritual directors in the evangelical church when I became a Christian. And I didn't hear it in the church at all until um, sometime, I think it was like maybe in the very late 1990s, um, no, actually, I'm sorry. It was after that. It was in 2000. It was sometime in, it had to be after 2005. When I was doing research, when I was writing my first article on the Enneagram, which I put on my website in 2011. So I had already started, I'd already researched some in the 1990s, but I didn't write anything up. I researched for some missionaries who were overseas. Um, and then I kind of just, you know, it's it sort of just, I didn't think about it anymore. And then um, I started hearing about it in the, the emergence, like Rob Bell and Tony Jones, who all became the progressives. Uh, at their conferences, they were using the Enneagram. And that's what led me to write my article. And at that time, the research I did, I noticed that one of the people I came across was Suzanne Stabile, who was working with Richard Rohr. And I believe she she and the other woman that I um, also wrote about, whose name escapes me now, right now, the other woman, I think, called herself a spiritual director. 
Now I knew that term from the Catholic. I knew that was in the Catholic church, not because I've been, I was never Catholic, but I knew that term. I just had come across it in my reading of this contemplative stuff, which I started reading in the late 1990s. And um, that's how long I've been researching this area. So it goes back to the late the 1990s, around 1990, I'd say 97, 98, maybe when I started reading these, these books. And um, so I knew the term spiritual director. I knew it was a, a in the Catholic church. And all of a sudden I'm seeing like, well, this isn't a Catholic church. Why do they have a spiritual director? Now we have them. We have spiritual directors galore all over the evangelical church. Um, this is a, this is part of this contemplative spirituality that's going on. The Lectio Divina, the spiritual director, the spiritual disciplines, even, uh, you know, Tim Mackey from the Bible Project yeah. is into it. He's fallen into it. And so he apparently was influenced by Thomas Keating, who's one of the co-founders of the contemplative prayer movement. I probably, you know, I could, I, I've done whole shows on this topic because there's so much to say. Yeah. So I probably should, should cut myself off. <laughs> no, I mean, hey, this is my show. We do whatever we want. Okay. <laughs> well, so it's, there's a lot to say about it because that this, I've been tracking it for so long and well, I've tell me, so tell me what that. Tell me what the difference is, you know, how we would read the Bible, um, you know, and interpret it according to the historical grammatical method, which if you don't know what that is, I guess somebody can email me about it. But just, you know, common sense on, on how you're reading normal literature in its genre and what they're saying. OK, yes, that's a good question. So what they're saying is, see, they don't say, well, don't study the Bible. You know, don't don't read it. And, 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 you know, we're not saying don't study the Bible the way you're studying the Bible, however you do that. But what what they're saying, although it's not as blatant, it's more uh, subtle, is um, if you really want, you know, that's that'll give you some head knowledge. But if you really want to be intimate with God and really feel a connection with him and feel close to him, then you need to sit still and you need to let yourself um, be in a state where your mind is not where you're not trying to figure things out, where you're not where you're not really. They won't say where you're not thinking, mm -hmm. but they'll say in this listening, receptive state. And then some of the practices that, that that go along with this actually are like the practices of Eastern meditation. This is how I initially became interested in this is that I noticed that the things being taught to do these contemplative prayer practices were coming from Eastern meditation techniques. And they were taken from there. And the three Trappist monks who started this movement admit it. They admit see, it. That's so, that's so tricky because like the Bible does talk about, um, you know, be still and know that I am God and meditating on the word and, and, and those sort of things. But you start blurring the lines, right? And you're using right. Christian language, but you're using it in a way that's not Christian. You know, you're meaning you're meaning something else by the same yes, by the same words. And as far as the be still and know that I'm God, that's actually the NASB says cease striving, and it's actually a rebuke to people for not trusting God. It has nothing to do with sitting physically still. It has nothing to do with contemplating was sitting there to meditate on God or anything like that. That's not what, the, if you read Psalm 46, it's got, it's about God reminding everybody he's in charge and they've forgotten it. Stop striving. He's saying, stop striving. He's talking to Israel and the enemies of Israel. And he's saying, you know, remember that I am in charge and this is what's going to happen. So the be still is one of the most misused verses of the contemplative movement. And so so what they say is Bible study is fine or regular prayer is fine, but the really to go deeper and to know God more and to be more intimate and to feel his love, you need to do this, these practices. So the contemplative prayer uses um, this. Um, sometimes they'll tell you to come up with a, a word, like a word from the Bible or something, a phrase like, like or just peace or you know, Jesus loves me or something. And you can repeat that. If your mind begins to wander, then you repeat it. Well, that's what you do with a mantra. See, that comes directly from Hinduism. 
Yeah. And so it's a it's a certain technique that you follow. And the other counterpart to um, biblical study is Lectio Divina. So they'll say, well, that's fine. Do your Bible study so you'll get head knowledge. But if you really want to experience God, then you do Lectio Divina, which is a particular technique where you you find a passage, usually they say, you know, not more than maybe six or seven or eight verses. And you read that passage slowly, several times. You do not read it in context. You do not think about the context. You just read it by itself. And then you wait for a word to jump out at you. And so a word jumps out at you and that's God's word for you. So that's the word that you're supposed to think about and meditate on because that's God giving you that word. See how subjective this is. This has nothing to do uh, yeah. with reading scripture. This is like a mystical, really new age way. Really, this this could be a new age method for, you know, take this book and read this several times. And then whatever word jumps out at you, that's the word that is going to give your life meaning today or whatever. It's it's just the new age. New agers could do that. So. Here's this technique, and it's called Lectio Divina. Churches are doing it. They're recommending it. They're teaching it. Um, and it has nothing to do with reading scripture the way God gave us scripture, which is it has meaning. It has meaning in context. You want to know the context of the passage, you know, and that's very important. <laughs> but this method, see, has not, it's a myth, it's treating the Bible like a mystical book. It's yeah, it, it all goes like, back to that. You know, it's like the, the old way that people would like flip the Bible open and point to a verse and be like, there's yeah. my verse for the day. And it's, yeah. just, it's just like pseudo sentimentality, emotional high that we want to get. Yes. You know, yes. to, like you said, the key word there is experience. And in the New Testament, the yes. key word is faith, not experience. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Like, you don't. You don't. Yes. The way we it's, interact with God is through faith. And I'm not discounting. That, you know, we walk with God and we have experiences with God, right. and, you know, from right. that we learn, you know, um, to trust in him more. Because like right. I, I've said this many a times, you know, as I'm like trying to lead my family, it's like, hey, I've seen God do X with me in the past so I can trust him in this situation now. Right. Exactly. But exactly. that comes from knowing the word of God. That right? comes. That's how we know. That's how we learn about who God is mm -hmm. primarily through the word. And then, yes, and I always like to point out when I talk about this, I am not against people having experiences. Yeah. I've had some wonderful experiences where, you know, for example, maybe during um, a, a worship song, I've really felt, you know, maybe the presence of the Holy Spirit or yeah. I've, I've felt close to Christ during prayer or maybe witnessing to someone. I have felt the Holy Spirit there helping me or whatever. But those experiences come from, first of all, our relationship with the Lord through the practices of worship, Bible reading, and prayer. Mm -hmm. That our experiences arise now and they come naturally. We don't force them, we don't do a technique to bring the experience on. Because when you do, as soon as you do a technique to induce an experience, that is paganism. That's mm -hmm. exactly what the pagans do. They do techniques or methods or whatever, you know, practices in order for something to happen, whether it's an experience or something else. And so when you try to bring on the experience through your methods, then you're, you're doing a pagan practice. That's not biblical. So these people will do these things and they will have a good experience. So they think they're really having a spiritual experience with, with Christ or with God. And they think, oh, I really felt God's love when I did this particular contemplative prayer practice. Yeah. And that's what these people hype. They're like, and they, and they also make a false dichotomy between the mind and the heart. And they'll say, see, you know, like I, I mentioned earlier, study the Bible, that's good head knowledge. That's the kind of thing they'll say. And they'll say, but if you really want to know God with your heart, then do this. So they make this false di distinction between the head and heart, which the Bible does not make. And they um, talk about 
all the regular stuff that's done, like regular prayer and Bible reading, et cetera, regular discipleship, but that's all kind of superficial. You have to go deeper and this is how you go deeper. So that's how, that's how this thing is being promoted and sold. That's the propaganda. And one more thing I want to say that's really, really crucial. Every single Bible verse I have seen used by these teachers and by people who promote this, every single Bible verse they refer to has been misused. Imagine I have that. yet to see a one Bible verse saying that uh, any Bible verse they say that supports this, I have yet to see any of those used correctly. And I, I have detailed that in several of my articles. For example, um, uh, Ruth Haley Barton is one of the biggest contemplative teachers and one of the biggest influences in the church. Probably a lot of people don't know her name, but pastors, she does huge retreats with pastors and other church leaders. And I think that's kind of her main audience, although I don't think you have to be a pastor or church leader to go. I'm not sure. But that seems to be one of her main audiences. She's written several books. She wrote a book on spiritual rhythms and a book on uh, invitation to silence and solitude and six or seven other books. Well, I've read those two books, the spiritual rhythms book, which I can't remember the exact title now, and the invitation to silence and solitude. And... I show in there over and over again when she cites verses to support these things, how they're being misused or taken out of context. And by the way, guess what? Her mentor at her spiritual formation school, which is called the Shalem Institute here in the Washington, D.C. area. She came here for training to be a spiritual director. She's a spiritual director. Her mentor was a Buddhist nun. Hmm. A Buddhist yeah. nun. A Western Buddhist nun. Yes. Oh. And I, I wrote, I did a Facebook post when I discovered that, that, you know, Ruth Haley Barton had a Buddhist mentor and I did a whole Facebook post on it. And then I bring it up. I have a two part article on those two books that I mentioned she wrote that I read. I have a two part article um, on the two books because I kind of talk about them at the same time in the articles. And, um, I bring that up at one point about her Buddhist mentor, because it's important for people to know that. Uh, and, you know, Shalem Institute, where she went, they on their recommended books or the books that they use, some of them are Buddhist books. So this this contemplative spirituality has brought in, I call it, actually call it counterfeit Christianity. Mm -hmm. I have called it that. And it is counterfeit Christianity. It is not actually biblical Christianity. But it's I mean, a very clever counterfeit. It's very clever, cleverly disguised. Yeah, it's definitely tricky because, like we said, I mean, they'll, they'll use Christian language or kind yeah. of Christian pseudo Christian concepts, but they're they're using those phrases and those words in in a totally different, like with a total different definition. But they don't tell you. It's fine if you want to do that, but you have to redefine it. You have to say, now I'm using this term by meaning this. You know, because you like you are intentionally being deceptive if, you know, if you say something like, hey, we need to meditate on the word of God. Well, if I tell that to a Christian and I mean something like what you're talking about, you know, this like kind of Eastern meditation. But I tell that to a Christian, like I should know that they're thinking like meditation in the Christian sense. Right. Right. If I don't tell them that. If I don't tell them that. Yeah. If I don't tell them that I'm being intentionally deceptive to them. Yeah, well, well, yes, and they, and whether these people are are all deceived and they don't realize that, I, I really I can't say that. Maybe you know, maybe only the Lord knows that. But they they are misusing misusing the scriptures and they take it out of context. For example, Ruth Haley Barton, in I think her book, maybe it's her book on silence and solitude, where she has kind of this running theme about Elijah. And, you know, his whole thing going up to the cave in first, you know, the first Kings 19 after his showdown with the with the followers of, um, you know, Jezebel's follow, false priests and false prophets and everything. And he has a big showdown on the mountain and then he goes off and because he thinks, you know, she's trying to kill him. And well, I think she is. And so he has this thing where he's in the cave and, and it's that passage about uh 
which in the King James says a still small voice. Now, if you look at other translations, they don't all say that. Some of them say a small stirring. Some of them say um, like a noise, a gentle noise. So there, because the actual phrase apparently is hard to translate. Either they don't know exactly what it means or it's hard to translate. I can't remember. So there's different ways to translate that. But Elijah hears that, then he goes to the mouth of the cave and God speaks to him. So God isn't really talking to him there. God's getting his attention, but then he speaks to him verbally. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he's like, Elijah, what are you doing here? And so, um, that, but she takes that whole thing and all, this is another passage like the be still know that I'm God that the contemplatives use is the still small voice. You have to be quiet to hear the still small voice of God, because if you aren't quiet, if you, not just your surroundings, but your mind, so your mind has to be quiet because your mind's so busy and you're always thinking about things. And so you have to quiet your mind or you might not hear the still small voice of God. And so this is very Gnostic in the sense that you're hearing something kind of within you. It's something coming coming from the stillness, from this silence that you go into. That's the whole thing of the invitation to solitude and silence. And I also have shown that the so-called disciplines of silence and solitude are not taught anywhere in scripture. There's not a single passage that teaches you must be silent for any reason or that you must be still for any reason or that you must be alone for any reason. Now, there's nothing wrong with being alone and still and but by silence, I don't I don't mean just being quiet. I, of course, there's nothing wrong with being quiet. But when the contemplatives use silence, they're using it as this kind of method, this state that you get into so that you can hear God, feel his presence, get more intimate with God or whatever the agenda is. And Which, so you said is that's so it's subjective. About. It's very subjective. It's subjective. It's experience based. Mm -hmm. Um. And it's very Gnostic in the sense of this inner private experience and knowledge that you get through these techniques that are not based on scripture. They're not based on the teaching of scripture. And see, I think it's, again, it's so tricky because like, for example, I'll give you personally, right? Like I can agree, you know, Hey, sometimes my mind is racing a million miles an hour, you know, and I got a thousand things I'm thinking about, but I know that I need to pray. Or, you know, I'm being pulled in a hundred different directions that I know I need to read my Bible. And so, you know, sometimes I'm, I'm reading and it just, uh, yeah, it's just a checklist. You know what I mean? And I wasn't really trying to take in the word of God or sometimes yeah, I go to stop right. to pray and it's like, let me get my checklist of prayers out and then move on. And it's like, but was I really connecting with God? Right. So, yeah. So I think that there is an element where you go, Hey, look, let me take a deep breath. Let me pause here. Let me try to like not think about work or think about that project. I got to do at home and let the Lord know, like I am trying to honor my time with you now to where it's just right. me and you. It's not all this other stuff going on. I'm not just doing a checklist. I want to have time with you. Like all oh, that's well and good. Yeah. Right? And you can do that on your own. Yeah. You just decide you're going to, you know, for me, I, I use the word focus. I just need to focus. Mm -hmm. I'm reading this passage of scripture, scripture, let's say, and my mind wanders, you know, to something else. And I, all of a sudden I realize I'm reading and I'm not, but I'm not really reading, you know, mm -hmm. I'm just reading the words, but my, I'm actually thinking of something else. And, and it's like, oh, wait a minute, you know, I wasn't really reading that. And so I'm just going to go back and read it again. I'm just going to focus. So you can on your own, just say, I'm going to focus. I'm going to set these things aside. You don't need to do the stuff that they're telling you, but they use that very thing, that problem that a lot of people have where they're distracted, where they're busy, um, where they they feel they don't have enough time to read the Bible or to pray. They use that as a way to sell the contemplative stuff because mm -hmm. they'll say, see, are you having trouble doing this, this, this and this? Well, here's what you can do. We can show you. That's what the Be Still DVD does. Hmm. It constantly shows people busy, um, you know, the mother trying to make dinner and the kids are, are crying and the the, the, the man is rushing off because he's late and, um, you know, he's grabbing, grabbing his briefcase or whatever. And there's this idea of, oh, everyone's rushing and they're not, they don't have time, you know. So here, 
here's how you can have time and we'll show you how to do it and how you get closer to God. So that becomes their way of selling what they do as the answer to exactly what you were describing. But the, we don't need that answer. So they, they're, they're pointing out a problem. And as far as them pointing out this problem, they're correct. That, that, it, that can be a problem and is with people who have busy lives, but their solution is not the right solution. So, <laughs> See, this you know. what, I would say two things. Number one, it's so important for Christians to understand the need to, you know, have discernment and test the spirits, right? Don't just believe everything because some Christian author wrote a book or so you saw some Christian on a YouTube video, but also I'm, I'm, because I've been in Christian leadership, you know, like I've been in full-time ministry, I've been in part-time ministry, I've been in volunteer ministry. Like I've, I've become, I don't want to say too critical, but maybe sometimes I am, but I've become pretty critical of like Christian leaders and their lack of courage, their lack of understanding what their call is. You are a leader. Your life is dedicated to leading the people of God by his word. And you mm -hmm. got to have the boldness and you got to have the courage to know the word of God and stand up and say, this is wrong. Don't believe it. Right. You know? And people don't want to do that because they think, oh, like, you know, I'm going to hurt people's feelings or maybe some of my congregation believes right. it. And then you know, that, that little person, you know, is going to get their feelings hurt or maybe somebody's grandma believes it or, you know, like, yeah. oh, then I'm going to yeah. look like I'm a critical person. It's all just the desire to be praised by men rather than understanding your call for God. I think that that is part of it. And people are not, you know, there are very few people that I know of who have, you know, publicly criticized any of this stuff or, 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 or brought. Now, I think a lot of people, unfortunately, when you say leaders need to be bold and speak out, and I agree, but I'm afraid a lot of these leaders have fallen for it. Yeah, they just don't know. You know? They, and they're, they're fall they're into it and they're bringing it into their churches. And two of the main ways they're doing it, because I mentioned Richard Foster earlier as being one of the initial influencers to bring this into the church. But since then, now we have had in the past few years, the John Mark Comer and Peter Scazzaro, emotionally healthy spirituality um, is Peter Scazzaro's thing. And then John Mark Comer, who was a um, pastor at Bridgetown Church in Portland, Oregon, stepped down from his church, I think about two years ago, two or three years ago. And he now, he started something while he was still at his church called Practicing the Way. And um, I had explored the website at the time when he was still at the church. And now that's become his enterprise. That's all he's doing. And he's sending this material to churches everywhere. And I get messages on Facebook Oh, Marsha, my pastor, I've, I've seen your post on John Mark Comer. And now um, our pastor said the other day that we're going to start studying John Mark Comer's materials. <laughs> Boom. What? Oh, that's a, sorry. That's a, an alarm. <laughs> um, so, you know, now what do I do or what do I say or whatever? Um, and so this is what's happening. Cause I think I'm not sure, but I think he makes the materials available free. Hmm. And so that makes it even more appealing. Now, I don't know what Sp Peter Scazzaro's deal is, but his emotionally healthy spirituality book is used in a lot of churches. It has a workbook. All of these things come with workbooks. They come like package deals to be used in churches and study groups. Yep. So it's very convenient for pastors and um, either they're not, you know, checking it out and investigating and maybe another pastor that they trust said, oh, hey, this is great. We did this at our church. And they're like, oh, OK, let me get that for my church. So they're not investigating or they they are investigating and they're not discerning. I mean, I don't know what else to say, because I, I can't think of any other reason for why they would do it. Well, so I could, I could tell <laughs> I you, yeah, I'll tell you again, you know, one of my critiques is what I've seen and not everybody is like this, but what I've seen in a good number of Christian leaders is becoming, you know, a, a lead pastor or lead minister at a church. It's almost now like you're running a, um, almost like a small to medium sized nonprofit Christian organization rather than leading a church. So you're running this organization okay. and teaching is just a small to you aspect of that. So if you can delegate that out and you can contract that out in a different way, that frees you up to do all the other organizational stuff, you know, that you need right. to do rather than understanding right. your primary role as a preacher 
is to preach and teach the word of God. That is absolutely right. your primary right. goal. I mean, you're the shepherd. Yeah. You're the shepherd. You're the shepherd. You are supposed to be, and you are supposed to guard your sheep from false teaching. Mm -hmm. and you're supposed to be able. One of the qualifications in Titus, you're supposed to be able to refute false teaching. And that's the and that's oh. the hard work of stuff. You know, it's like yeah. sitting down, digging into the Word of God. You know, trying right. to get into it so you can bring something out to your people. But they, you don't want to do that hard work. Well, if you don't do that hard work, find something else to do. That's your yeah, job. don't be a, don't be a pastor, right? <laughs> don't be well, don't be a pastor if you don't want to do that. But unfortunately, that's what's happening, and these materials. So this teaching is spreading, and it's in a lot of seminaries. Uh, um, I, I I tell people that SES, uh, the seminary you and I went to, is one of the few that doesn't promote all of this mystical contemplative yeah. stuff. It's one of the few because some of the other ones like Biola big, big one with a big apologetics program promotes it. Some of the Baptist uh, Southern Baptist seminaries mm. promote it. Um, a lot of them promote it. And it's also promoted in Bible oh, college. Yeah. SES right there. Made the there you go. That's a seminary. If anybody's wondering mm -hmm. about what seminary to go to, go to check out Southern Evangelical Seminary, please, because yeah. They um, are one of the few that hasn't gone progressive or gone into this contemplative stuff because that progressive movement is really sweeping through the church. And, and, and that will also bring in the Enneagram, the Enneagram and contemplative stuff you also find in the progressive area of the church. But it's, it's hitting churches that at least used to be sound doctrinally. Yeah. And... Um, this contemplative stuff really it's 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 like this other thing you know that famous movie from way back the um where the uh the uh people from outer space come and they take they look like the they take over the bodies of the earth earth people uh, there's a famous uh oh, movie yeah, about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. i can't think of the name of it and they um you know so it looks like you know, Mary Smith, who works at the library, but it's really, it's really an alien. And, um, you know, that's almost what this counter, this, this, this contemplative thing is. I almost said counterfeit because that's what it is. That's like what this contemplative thing is. It's like, it's like, because some of these people who get into it, they're really, when you're, I've watched a lot of them on, on videos and stuff, speaking, talking, sometimes giving sermons, being interviewed. And it's like they're a Christian, but it's like there's something else there. Now, I am not saying they are not a Christian because I honestly don't know. I don't know. But the way they're talking and the way they're talking about Christ in the Bible, it's like it's something else. It's like when you have something right on point and it's right there. OK, that's that's what it is. But then you have it just off just a little bit. Mm -hmm. It's like, OK, it's almost there. It's almost that what I what I think it is. But. It's off. There's something off there. And that's that's what that's like. It's like this blur. And, um, you know, I, I'll never forget way back around 20, 2010, this woman emailed me and said that her pastor, she said, I've been in this church. For, she'd been there for a number of years. Our pastor is always sound, you know, gives these good sermons based on the Bible um, you know, he uses scripture and, and exegetes scripture. And she said, then a few months ago, he went to a, on a retreat and apparently it was at a, in a monastery and he was gone for two weeks or something. He came back and she said, it's like, he's another person. She said, I, she said, it's so strange. Now he's quoting mystics. He, you know, he wants us to read the mystics, um, that's the only word she knew for that. And she said, um, you know, I went to talk to him and to try to, you know, understand why are you quoting all these mystics and everything? <laughs> and and it's, she said his sermons are different. And she said it was very strange. She said it was like it wasn't even him. Hmm. She said it's like it wasn't him. It was like he was gone and it was somebody else who had taken his place. She said it was the most bizarre experience. And she tried to talk to him and she said it just, you know, he's very nice and affable and, you know, but it just, he just, nothing she, he, she said had any impact on him. It's like he just dismissed it. Yeah. And um, I'll never forget that. I'll never forget that woman telling me that. Well, look, it's so important. Like I said, we all 
are responsible for our own faith. We have to have discernment. That's why we right. always read the Word of God and filter everything else through that. We don't take something and attach it, you know, to our Christianity and then start twisting the Word of God to make it fit that thing right. because that thing is cool right. or in, you know, in the fat at the moment. Well, anyways, Marsha, hey, thanks for coming for the third third episode. Yeah, sure, <laughs> sure. That, Appreciate it. That got that got into a lot of stuff there. <laughs> uh, well, you know, that means we're going to have to bring you back and get into more detail. Okay. Yes. Yes, definitely. Cause I definitely have some more I could say that's for sure. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. And again, we're going to put, we're going to put your website and some of the links to those articles uh, in the description below, wherever you're listening to this. So make sure you check those out, everybody. Okay. All right. Thanks, thanks Marsha. Thank you.